As we continue our series on the Holman family, I hope this is helping you, and I'd like to encourage you, if this is helping you, it might help others. And so if you have any friends, family, neighbors that you think might benefit from this, encourage them to go to our website, and they can download or watch these services and hear these messages. As I've said, uh, our home is in trouble. The homes of America are getting away from the Bible, and we need to bring them back to the Scriptures and to God's instructions. And tonight we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 19. I think the Bible plainly teaches us that the family is the primary social unit of every society, and it's one worth protecting and one worth keeping. Folks, the problems that exist in many families today do not usually stem from wrong motives. They stem from wrong methods. People are listening to what worldly counselors and philosophers are saying about how to raise children and, and what's best for the home, and the methods are all wrong. We've got to get back to the way God planned it and the way God intended it. There are two related evils that threaten successful parenting in our day and time, and they have led to the demise of the family. I believe the first is the downplaying of the significance of the husband-wife relationship. We're going to talk about that tonight. The other is the trap of child-centered parenting. We're going to look at that tonight. To avoid these threats, parents must learn early on that God pre-programmed all factors of what will make a successful family in his divine plan. And again, if you violate Bible principles, you forfeit God's blessings. When you embrace God's commandments, then his blessings are yours. Stand with me as we read our text tonight, Proverbs chapter 19. And most of Proverbs is Solomon speaking to his children. Many times you see my son, and he's talking to his children, giving them wise counsel. And we need to look at this tonight. Look at verse 11. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul, but he that despiseth his ways shall die. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. And that which he hath given will he pay him again. Chasten thy son while there is hope. And let not thy soul spare for his crime. Amen. You may be seated. Pray that God will bless this to your hearts and bless our homes. Again, no church is stronger than the homes that make up that church. So we need strong homes. We need strong relationships within the families. What is a family? There was a day in time nobody would even think that that would be debatable, but it is today. There are many today that are trying to describe a family that is completely foreign to what the Bible says. I believe the family is made up of both primary 
and secondary social clusters. The primary family cluster contains three relationships. The husband-wife relationship, the parent-child relationship, and sibling-to-sibling -sibling relationship. The secondary cluster would contain the grandparents and grandchildren, the uncles, the aunts, nieces, nephews, cousins, uh, in-laws. That would come into play. But folks, nowhere does the Bible support the notion that two or more unrelated people living together constitute a family. That's the problem we're seeing today. The greater the common ground for these family relationships, the greater will be the unity, the love, the stability, the joy that each family member will experience. So let's look at this tonight. These two relationships, the husband-wife relationship, first of all, the husband-wife relationship is paramount to a strong family. Think of God's pattern. The greatest overall influence folks are going to have on your children does not come in the role of you being mom or dad, but it's in that role of husband and wife. See, our society has forgotten this basic Bible truth. We're living in a day when our society is consumed with child-centeredness. And folks, it only produces self-centered children. Now you're going to hear some things probably tonight you've never heard anywhere else. But I want you to think about this and see if this is not really the, the case and the problem we're seeing today. The Bible establishes biblical foundations for the family. Go back to Genesis chapter 2 with me. Let's go back to Adam and Eve once again. God wants us to know exactly what he was thinking when he made the man and the woman and brought them together. Genesis chapter 2 addresses two central questions. Why did God create the woman? And secondly, what was his purpose for marriage? Right? Think about this. Genesis chapter 2, let's read this again. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. It goes on to describe the Garden of Eden, God's creation. Drop down to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That would be his job. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now look at verse 18. This is going to answer that first question. Why did God create the woman? This answers that. The Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Now it goes on to talk about creating the animals. And then he dropped down to verse 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept. He took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. All right, God made the woman for the man. It's not good, he said, that man should be alone. Man needs a helper suitable for him. There's God's intent for the woman. Man was alone and that was not good. Now he was not alone in the sense he had the fellowship of God. 
I guess you could say he had the fellowship of the animal kingdom. And the animal kingdom back then was a lot different than it is today. There were no wild animals before sin. So in some sense, Adam could, could, he could enjoy the fellowship of God and the animals. But he lacked fellowship with one of his own kind. And I think it's implied here that he needed someone, a total person. Not just one aspect of man's being, but it was not good for man to be alone spiritually or socially or emotionally or physically. Man needed a mate. Someone like him and yet someone that would be different. We talked about that for the last Sunday, celebrate the difference. We talked about God's design for man and woman and how they were made different. So God pronounced that man needed a helpmate and he made Eve and brought her to the man. She was a suitable helper for Adam. Now if all God had in mind was that Adam needed a helper to tend the garden... Another man would have been a better fit than a woman. If that's all he needed was a helper to keep the garden, why not another man? But God did not give Adam an Evan. He gave Adam an Eve. He gave man a woman. Adam's needs were special and more specific than any other creature God had made. Now think about this. He brought the man and the woman together. And they too represented the fullness of God's character. God brought the woman to the man. See, he didn't leave her to just scamper around until they found one another. God brought her to him. And presented her to him. And God united the two himself. So he provided a companion that was what would perfectly meet Adam's needs. Now marriage, again folks, marriage is God's idea. It's not man's idea. For this cause, now God created a woman, but also for this cause, God instituted marriage. God instituted marriage. Now today, many think marriage is optional. That marriage is not really needed. A couple can just live together. They don't have to get married. Not according to the Bible. God meant for the husband and wife to enter into a marriage covenant. Not a contract, it's a covenant. Amen? Help me out now. And here's the thing I want you to see. And here's where some of you may at first buck on this. But think about this. God said the man and the woman together was very good before there were children the family was complete with a husband and a wife it did not take children to complete the family children only expanded the family the family was complete with the husband and wife now you think about that if children were necessary to complete the family God would have created the children and then said, this is very good. Folks, listen. The marriage relationship lacks nothing. Woman alone completes man. Man alone completes woman. There's the nucleus of the human family unit. Think about the guiding principles here. The husband-wife relationship, folks, we must view, view this as a priority relationship in the family. 
That refers to the prevailing attitude that must be present for successful parenting. Parents, if you love your children, then make your marriage relationship a priority. It comes first. We said in the home, mom and dad are the heart and head of the home, right? Mom's the heart of the home and dad's the head of the home. Bible says that. And both are needed in raising children. Now, I know we're living in a day and time when the idea of the man being the head of the house, that comes under, un, under a lot of attack. Our world resists that idea. But it really makes sense. The family needs a head. The family needs a leader. The home is, is a lot like a football team. Everybody familiar with the football team? The different positions? Who calls the plays and directs the team on the field? The quarterback, right? Now who says the quarterback gets to call the plays? The coach does, right? He says the quarterback gets to call the plays. Does that mean that the quarterback is the best athlete on the team? Not necessarily. He may not be the best athlete. There may be others that are faster and stronger and, and maybe even smarter, but the quarterback calls the play because the coach says so. See, they go into a huddle. They're not in there voting on what play to run next, are they? If you never played football, maybe you don't know what they do in a huddle. They don't even huddle anymore, do they? They, they've got the no-huddle offense going on, but and when, they, when they do huddle, they're not voting on what play to run. The quarterback calls the play. Now, he might get a lot of free advice. A lineman might say, hey, I can open up a hole here, run, run through my hole. I can beat this guy. A wide receiver might say, hey, I've been open all day on this route. Look for me. I'll be open. The quarterback gets a lot of free advice. But the quarterback calls the play. The coach says he can. Now, there are times when the coach calls the play himself. He sends the play in, and the quarterback calls the play sent in by the coach. Now, sometimes he may call an audible. How many knows what that is? That's when a coach sends in a play and the quarterback changes. And sometimes the coach gives him leeway to do that. He can change the play. Now here's the whole thing. Everybody listen to me. The husband is the quarterback. Who says so? Coach God says so. Now, most of the plays, fellas, that we call, God has already sent in. Amen? Here, here's our playbook right here. And by learning the Bible, I'm just falling apart everywhere tonight. By learning the Bible, we know what place to call. We know what to do in various situations that arise in the home. Now, the wife can give advice. The children, when they get old enough, they can chime in. But the husband's father Ladies, don't buck against that. Especially if you've got a good Christian man who's trying to lead you by the Bible. Support him and let him lead the family. And by the way, guys, I, I'd, I'd warn you about calling too many audibles. It's pretty safe to just follow the plate God sent in and do it that way. We usually get in trouble when we start changing the play that God wants us to run. Does that make sense? Amen? Let's do it God's way, and God can bless. So the marriage, the husband-wife relationship is the priority relationship. The other relationships in the home are subjected to that. 
You've got to have authority in the home. And the parents provide that God-given authority. And they enforce God's moral laws in the home and with the children. Now the problem we got today is permissive parenting. And permissive parenting was never God's design. Hey, if there's to be a harmony in the home, parents must assume their God-given roles. Children must assume their God-given roles. Children are not to run the home. But you see that a lot today, don't you? But I'm going to tell you something. Children will feel more security and stability when mom and dad are fulfilling their roles. Let's think about the parent-child relationship. First of all, we need to avoid the booby trap of child-centered parenting. Here's what I see happening today. A couple gets married. Children are born into that family. And I see couples leaving their first love for one another and focusing their love extensively upon the children. They do that in the name of good parenting, but it's actually the first step to breaking up the family. Now bear with me here. There is a problem with having child-centered homes and families. The belief that children are the center of the family instead of welcomed members of the family is what I'm talking about. Parents who center their world around the nurture of their children, this is permissive parenting and child-centered families. And they usually don't work. Think about this. Permissive parents bring the world to the child instead of bringing that child into their world. Now think about that. Because all this is very subtle. But if you think about it and look around what's going on today, this is exactly the problem we're seeing here in America. This attacks the husband-wife relationship and the priority of that relationship and reduces their biblical significance. Child-centered parenting wrongly authorizes one parent to pull away from the other, ignoring what God has said. What he's joined together, let no one separate. That's talking even about the husband and wife. Are you with me? Child-centered parenting fosters family independence instead of family interdependence. Here's what happens. Children grow up perceiving that they are the center of the family. They become selfish and they are robbed of the opportunity to invest in that family. All they learn is to take. They don't learn to give. Do you see that in families today? It's all around us. Where there is no relational investment, there's no reason for any family loyalty or unity. And these parents do not realize that all their good intentions of fostering this idea, it only develops kids with meism. Me, 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 me. It's all about me. God created us with the capacity to give and take. Right? Be a giver more than be a taker. But folks, we're living in a society today is, is a bunch of takers. They expect, it, 
the parents to provide everything without them working to do anything. They don't invest anything in the family. They don't offer to help out. They're always there with their hand out. Give me, give me, give me. And we've got a generation of takers, and they grow up, and what have you got? You've got a generation that expects the government to take care of it. Come on. We have got a generation today that think they are entitled to everything. They just want the government to take care of them. They don't want to work. They don't want to invest in this country. And it all started in the home. That's the way they were raised. Are you with me? If you don't invest into this, then you're not going to offer much. Parents train their children to take and not give. I think some of them wrongly believe that if they demonstrate giving, giving, giving to their children, that their children will naturally grow up to be givers. And that doesn't work. You would think, well, since mom and dad are givers, then Junior or Sissy ought to be givers. No, they're takers. That's all they've ever done is take. They haven't been taught. They haven't, been in, they haven't been taught to invest in this family. You've got problems. You think about the child raising philosophy and books that are around this last generation. He grows up, children grow up ill prepared for real life, in which the stability. To give and take is going to be a prerequisite in every relationship. Here, here's the thing, folks. If they don't learn it at home, they're going to suffer at school. They're going to suffer at work because they will expect other people to cater to them like mom and dad do. And when they're not catered to at school and when they're not catered to on the job, They don't understand why everybody else doesn't just do everything for them like mom and dad do. That's why you've got people that can't hold down a job. That's why you've got people that cannot succeed in school. It goes back to the home. We've gotten away from what God intended the home to be. The modern child raising philosophy is behind all this. Let me share with you a poem by Vance Havner. Preachers got on to glory. Listen to this. And this is dealing with the modern child raising philosophy and the books that are read while the Bible's ignored. It goes like this Junior bit the meter man, Junior kicked the cook. He's just antisocial now, according to the book. Junior smashed the clock and lamp. Junior hacked the tree. Destructive trends are all explained in chapters 2 and 3. Junior tossed his shoes and socks out into the rain. Aggression, that's normal. Disregard the stain. Junior got in Grandpa's room, tore up his fishing line. That's to get attention. Chapters 8 and 9. Grandpa seized the belt. Yank Jr. crossed his knee. For Grandpa hasn't read a book since 1943. <laughs> That's what Jr. needed. Amen? Child-centered parenting. Folks, it, it comes dangerously close to idolatry. When a child's happiness is the greatest goal instead of his holiness. Now listen to me. Mom and dad, it's not their happiness that's the most important. It's their holiness. You raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If 
They grow up to be holy people. Happiness will come with that eventually. But when the child becomes the center of the home, and if he's the center of the home, the Lord's not. Come on. If that child's the center of the home, Christ is not. That's a subtle form of idolatry. In some homes, the children have become the little gods who parents worship. They worship their creation instead of their creator. Secondly, or should be achieving a balance in Christian parenting. Folks, we cannot overstate how necessary, how important the husband-wife relationship is to the children. The basic emotional needs of the children, they want to feel safe and secure. They want to be in a home where there's harmony, where there's unity. Strong marriages provide that. Weak marriages do not. Hey, even the little tot has radar. That little tot can sense when things are not right between mom and dad. And it grieves them. It grieves them. It worries them when mom and dad are not what they ought to be. And that relationship is not what it ought to be. When mom and dad are always fighting and mad at one another. That does something to the emotion and mental state of your children. In contrast, when the child has confidence in mom and dad that they love one another and that they are together raising that family. When there is harmony in the home, there will be stability in that family. That's important. A strong marriage is what provides a haven of security so that those children can grow up in a nurturing process. Now, it's easy to get caught up in child-centered parenting, especially the younger children. They're so dependent upon their parents, and parents enjoy that, that their children depend upon them for everything, and they get to meet all their needs. It's easy to be a child-centered parent. But folks, life does not stop when you have children. When you ladies became a mother, you did not stop being a wife. You did not stop being somebody's daughter or somebody's sister. Amen? And those relationships that were important to you before the children came along, you should maintain them after they come. If mom and dad have a date night once a week before the children came, I think it should be maintained after the children come. Be good for you as a couple to let somebody else watch the kids one night and go out and spend some time together as a couple. Children, they don't usually go through separation anxiety if mom's with dad, and they know that. Men, when you bring home a gift for the kids, why don't you bring home something for your wife also? Remember her. Ladies, try to do something special for your husband from time to time. C continue to cultivate that relationship because the family is based on that. Have a family devotional time. Get together and read the Bible together and pray together and pray for one another. I think it's good for kids to hear mom and dad pray. 
and pray for them. Get the family together and have prayer requests. And pray for what the kids are dealing with and what's coming up. Help them memorize Bible verses. Let them stand before the family and quote Bible verses. You think that would harm the family to do that? No, they need to hide the word of God in their heart so that they'll not sin. Folks, priority relationships are not arbitrary. They're not dictated by circumstances or social fads. Relationships within the family will function best when we do it God's way, and you're going to have the family love and unity that you desire. Protect your marriage. I've talked to people. I look out, and there's people I wish were here. That need this. I'm talking about in our in our church, we've got people that need to hear this. And it grieves me that they're not here. Because I hear them talk about putting children ahead of their spouse. And folks, that's just a recipe for disaster. God has shown us the priority relationship. And a strong marriage will be a stabilizing factor against the shocks of this life. Children are to be welcome members of the family, but never the center of the family. Do you understand this? If you don't go to Betty and she'll explain it better, probably. Because I think we're in agreement on this. Hey, parents, children need parents, not playmates. And that's what a lot of parents have become. Instead of being the father and the mother that that young person needs, they want to be the playmate and run with them and play with them and not provide the strong Christian example that they need. Of course, the most important relationship is your relationship with Christ. Make sure that he's at the center. Instead of putting a child at the center of your home, put Christ at the center of your home. Do everything to please him. Because no home is going to be complete, no home is going to be successful unless Christ is the center of that home. Children need moms and dads who love the Lord and will serve Him. So let me close with this question. Are you saved? Are you saved? Would you like to be saved and know that you have a home in heaven? If so, then humbly repent of your sins tonight and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior.